Hi, I'm Denise and I'm a home sourdough baker. As I'm very often asked how to start making bread with sourdough, I will show you how to make your first sourdough bread, explaining in detail the what, the how and the why of every step of the sourdough bread making. Let's start first with why to bake sourdough bread. Why is sourdough bread so special? The answer is simple, because it is healthy, tastes and smells incredibly. Unlike the yeast bread, sourdough bread requires more time and its making spread over several hours or even days. The sourdough bacteria needs time to eat the sugars in your flour and this works also in your advantage in order to develop amazing flavors and to make more digestible and healthier bread. Sourdough bread making has the following successive phases. First is the flour hydration in a phase called autolyse. Then, when the sourdough starter is added, starts another phase called bulk or first fermentation. Then, it follows a second phase of fermentation, known also as final fermentation, that starts after the bread is shaped. Then is the baking and then in the end, you let the bread to cool at room temperature. The entire process takes almost one day, starting let's say Saturday at 2pm and putting the bread on the table for the Sunday's lunch. However, only 30 to 45 minutes in total you'll need to effectively dedicate from your time to make this bread. A sourdough loves temperatures between 25 to 30 degrees Celsius when it becomes very active. I made this bread in a hot day when I had 27 degrees Celsius in my kitchen. If your kitchen has lower temperatures, you'll need to find a warm spot in your house where you can keep your dough during proofing, a place like on top of the fridge, near a coffee machine or close to a radiator. It can be any place near a device that is constantly warm. In fact, you can proof dough at lower temperatures, but you'll need to increase the bulk fermentation time and keep an eye on your dough. Temperature and time are in direct relation. The lower the temperature, the more time it requires for the dough to proof. For example, if you have only 21 degrees Celsius in your room, you might need to increase your bulk fermentation to more than 6 hours instead of 4, as I mentioned in the recipe. In my schema, I indicated both the timing and the temperature so you can try it in similar conditions. But now, let's see what you need as ingredients. Sourdough bread is mainly made of only three ingredients, flour, water and salt. The flour is the most important ingredient and choosing a good flour to bake with should be your first decision. Look for the strongest white wheat flour that you can find. Strong flour means high protein content. Look at the package and search for the protein line. Usually, the bread flour is at 10-12% to protein content, but the strongest ones are at 14-15%, to but they are difficult to find. Pastry flour comes with protein content lower than 10%, and it should not be your first choice for baking your first bread. This doesn't mean that you cannot bake bread with low protein flour, it only means that it's more difficult. Protein percentage is just one quality factor for wheat flour that helps your bread to raise more. But buying an organic flour from a local farm can be more important for health reasons. Do not buy bread mix flours or self-raising flours, as most of them contain yeast or other raising agents and this is not what you are looking for. You want your sourdough to raise the bread. Also, do not fall into the beginner's trap and make your first sourdough bread with a lot of whole wheat flour. While whole wheat flour is very healthy, this flour is very difficult to work with and without proper techniques and skills you'll end up with a flat and dense bread. Also flours like rye, kamut, buckwheat, spelt, einkorn are very tempting, but each of them behaves differently and you should first learn how to bake with white with flour before adventuring yourself into other types of flour. The second ingredient is water and it is better to use filtered water or boiled and cooled tap water. Bottled water is also an option. The third ingredient is salt. 
Use kosher salt if you have, otherwise table salt is fine as well. And to raise your bread, you need a raising agent and that is your sourdough starter. Sourdough starter is in fact just flour and water with the right bacteria captured from the air. If you want to bake bread with sourdough, I assume you already have a sourdough starter. If you don't, I have a link in the description about how to make your own starter. It is important that you have an active sourdough starter. Active means that after feeding, your starter raises at least two times in eight hours when kept at room temperature. You need to use your starter when it is at its peak time. This recipe considers that your sourdough peak time is at 4 pm, after you have fed the starter in the morning. How quickly your starter arrives at peak, it is something for you to test before baking with the starter. But enough with the theory, let's start the bread. Let's assume it's 2 pm. Every bread starts with scaling the ingredients. And this recipe is based on a very easy to remember formula called 1 to 3. For more about the author of this formula, you can check the link in the description. 1 to 3 means 1 part sourdough, 2 parts water and 3 parts flour. More exactly, 150 grams of sourdough starter, 300 grams of water, 450 grams of flour. Salt is about 2% of the flour quantity. With these quantities, you'll bake a one big bread of 900 grams. Start by scaling your ingredients using a balance and put them on the table to ensure there is nothing forgotten. After scaling, you start mixing only the flour with water and just until there is no dry flour remaining in the bowl. Then, you leave the dough to rest for two hours. During this time, the flour hydrates. Flour proteins plus water equal gluten. Gluten molecules starts to create chains with other neighbor gluten molecules, making your flour elastic without you even touching it. This is the autolyse phase. I created a detailed video on the importance of autolyse and I invite you to find out more about autolyse in the link above. Generally, if you skip this phase, you'll need to knead your dough for a longer time. I use 12% protein flour for this recipe, but if your flour is lower than mine in protein content, you need to add a bit more flour. Let's say between 20 to 50 grams more, depending on how low is the protein content of your flour. If your dough looks wetter than mine, this is the way how to correct it. At this stage, take a look at how shaggy this dough is. Cover the bowl with a plate, lid, bag, whatever you have at hand, to avoid the dough drying on the surface and leave it at room temperature. After two hours of dough resting, you add your sourdough starter. Your starter should be now at peak and very active. You pour it over the dough, press it with your fingers and fold the dough over itself to well combine the two. Remember that when you add the sourdough, the bulk fermentation begins. This recipe indicates a medium hydration dough and that's why it is easy to work with. Dough hydration is given by the percentage of the weight of water relative to the one of the flour. Remembering that our starter is at 100% hydration, meaning that half is water and half is flour, let's calculate the hydration of our dough. As liquid, we have 300 grams of water from the recipe plus half of the weight of the starter, 75 grams, which is 375 grams. The total flour is 450 grams from the initial recipe plus half of the weight of the starter, 75 grams, which is 525 grams. Dividing these totals leads us to 71.4% hydration dough. A dough that is more than 73% hydration falls under the high hydration category and requires more skills to handle it. But some types of flowers, like whole wheat, absorb more water so the percentage will be up as well. 
But now let's come back to our dough. Salt comes immediately after, but it is not wrong if you put both sourdough and starter together. Salt is not an ingredient just for taste. Salt has its role in proofing the dough. First, it delays the fermentation. This means that a dough with salt will have a slower raise than one without. The advantage is that during this time the dough gets more flavor. Second, the salt makes the gluten connection stronger and you'll be able to better shape it later. If salt should not be in your diet, just exclude it, accepting the disadvantages of dough lacking salt. Knead the dough for 5 to 10 minutes using this simple and gentle method. You put your hand under the dough, releasing it from the bowl, you raise it a bit and then relax it. Repeat this move, turning slowly the bowl. This method is less messy because the dough remains in the bowl. The more you knead it, the smoother it becomes. If your hand hurts while kneading, make a small pause. 10 minutes of kneading is better than 5. There is no risk of overmixing when you knead your dough by hand. If it happens that you have a dough mixer, ease your task and let the machine do this for you. 10 minutes on the slowest speed are just enough. In my schema, I indicate 30 minutes between the adding of the sourdough and salt and the next step that is the stretch and fold. These 30 minutes include the mixing of the dough of 10 minutes. It is important to read the dough rather than following the exact timing of a recipe. Many variables like humidity, temperature, quality of flour can affect how the dough looks like. But if you learn to read the dough, you'll know if the dough is on the right track and if it is not, you'll know how to fix it. Pay attention to how the dough looks like more smooth, more elastic, more extensible, and this is thanks to the previous 2 hours of autolys plus few minutes of kneading. If you try to stretch the dough, you'll see a difference compared to how the dough looked before the autolys. Notice also that the dough sticks less to your hands. Now leave the dough covered for 20 minutes. You agitated the dough and it needs a well-deserved rest. In fact, this rest allows the time for the gluten to develop, meaning to create new bones with other molecules in its neighborhood. You needed the dough in the previous steps and now you wonder why handling it again? It is a good reason for this. Your dough is elastic, but it lacks strength. This means that if you try to shape the bread now, it will fall flat. You want your bread in a beautiful raised shape. So, what you need to do is quite simple. With your hand, take the dough from one side, stretch it up and fold it over itself. Turn the bowl 90 degrees and repeat. You can do 4 turns of the bowl to cover all the sides and you can even continue with 4 more turns if the dough allows you. This is the stretch and fold technique and you will do it 3 times at 1 hour interval. What happens with this movement is that you create layers of dough by folding them one on top of the other. This creates structure and your dough will be able to stand by itself in the end of the proofing. Between the stretch and folds you leave the dough to relax. It is normal that the dough flattens after the resting time, but the gluten structure is inside and you'll notice that at the last stretch and fold it will not flatten that much. After one hour, you do the second set of stretch and folds. The window test shows a better and better dough. Also, do you notice that the dough is not as flat as it was with the first set of stretch and folds?
and after another hour you do the third set of stretch and folds. The dough can be stretched even more through the window test. Do you notice how easy you lift the dough from the bowl when you try to do the stretch? This is dough strength. It doesn't let you stretch it more. It fights you back. You've done all these steps for your dough to keep its shape. And now you'll see the results. For this time, you'll work with flour on the board and on your hands. Dip your hand in flour and take the dough out of the bowl, putting it face down on the board. Then, stretch it gently in a squared shape, avoiding to degas it too much. in three from the sides and roll it from the other direction. Seal the dough to keep it together. Then the point is to create tension on its surface. This tension will keep your dough into one round piece and will allow you a nice scoring and oven spring later. So, with your hands just lightly floured and with almost no flour on the board, rotate the dough with your hands or push it gently towards you. Do you notice how smooth the top of the dough becomes? This is what you are looking for. But this is not the final shape and we need to let the dough rest again for half an hour. Cover it with a towel to avoid dryness on its surface. You give now the dough a final shape with the same movements you ended the pre-shape. You sprinkle the dough with flour as you need to place it face down in a banneton. If this is your first bread, most probably you do not have a banneton, but for sure you have a strainer on top of which you lay a simple towel. Dust it well with flour and place the dough face down in the banneton. I do now an optional step. I do a stitch with the same purpose to create tension. Let's look again at the dough. With my finger, I press gently the dough. Do you notice that the dough springs quickly back to me? This is the finger test. If the spring back is quick, the dough is underproofed. If it doesn't spring back, it's overproofed. But if it springs back slowly, the dough is proofed correctly. In our case, we need to leave the dough to rise for one hour more at room temperature. After that, you put it in the fridge. 
Verify that your fridge cools down at around 5 degrees Celsius, as at this temperature the dough continues its proofing very, very slowly overnight. The next day, when you are ready to bake, the first thing you need to do is to preheat your oven and your combo cooker at 270 degrees Celsius. This combo cooker is a Dutch oven that can be reversed. It takes me around 30 minutes to preheat my combo cooker. When it is ready, that is the moment you take the dough out of the fridge. Look at how tall and beautiful it is. Sprinkle some semolina and reverse it gently in the hot pan. With a razor blade fixed on a coffee stick, score it with your desired pattern. Score it 1 to 2 cm deep and immediately put it in the oven. Scoring is not done just for the design purpose. It helps raising your loaf to its maximum potential. The loaf goes into the oven with the other tall part of the combo cooker on top. It is essential to close the pot so you can capture inside the steam released by the bread during cooking. This helps the dough to raise and it will give you a nice oven spring. The baking has two parts. First, you bake it at 270 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. In this first part of baking, the bread raises as much as it can. All your work to develop gluten all your work to give strength to your dough is revealed now, in these first 20 minutes of baking. Then, you open your oven, remove the top of the combo cooker and here is your bread half cooked. Reduce the temperature to 220 degrees Celsius and continue to bake for 25 minutes more. The bread continues to finish its baking even after you take it out of the oven. That's why it is so important that you do not cut it immediately. I know, I know, it is very difficult to resist its smell without trying it. It takes at least two full hours for the bread to cool to the room temperature. Cutting the bread is the most exciting and satisfying moment in making bread. You did this. You just made a gorgeous sourdough bread with your own hands and efforts. Bon appétit!